so we promised a, a quick break this time. So we'll uh, pull everybody together, and after we hear Dr. Morton's presentation, we'll have a, a proper 15-minute break before our panel. So um, we are honored to now present uh, Dr. David Morton, who got his PhD in 1983 in zoology from Cambridge University in England, and did postdoctoral research in neurobiology at the University of Washington in Seattle from 1983 to 1990. His first faculty position was at the University of Arizona in Tucson through 1997. He's been at OHSU since 1997, professor in 2002, and has been the associate dean for research since 2011. Dr. Morton used insects as models for biomedical research his entire career and has been continuously funded by NIH since 1991. So we are honored to have you here with us today. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that working okay? Good. So um, I'd like to thank Sarah for organizing this, and it's wonderful to have all these members of the public come here. So Joe was talking about how there's an anti-science movement. Here we have people that are interested in spending their Saturday afternoons coming to find out about science and the most recent research. That's fantastic. So, you know, it's great. We've had an MD, PhD speaking first. We've had a plant geneticist, now a zoologist, all coming together to try and help understand what causes ALS. So what I'd like to start first about, insects. Why insects? You know, why should we pay money? Why should your tax dollars go to research on insects? So first of all, um, I'm a zoologist. I think they're really cool and have really interesting biology. <laughs> so you've seen the nature shows, you've seen, oh, that's really cool and fascinating. That doesn't quite fly, however, unfortunately. But the other thing is to remember they have a huge economic impact on the US economy. Okay, so 67, 57 billion in 2006 as agricultural pests, as one aspect. Of course, they have positive benefits as well, pollinators. You've all heard about the disappearing pollinators. Okay, to really understand that and address that, we need to understand the biology of insects to try and figure that out. And of course, have a direct impact on human disease as um, vectors of various different diseases. But also, what I want to talk about today, they're fantastic models for human diseases. Okay? So, there's a long history of using simple invertebrate model organisms. And these are probably the three most famous invertebrate model organisms, in, certainly in terms of ALS research. So, the fruit fly, Drosophila, and also this nematode worms, the elegans, and I think in one of the pamphlets it's actually talking about yeast as a model for ALS. I mean, yeast don't even have nervous systems, so how can that work, okay? So one thing you can use these model organisms for is to identify novel compound, components of a, bio, of a normal biological process that only later turn out to have implications in human health and disease. And again, that's echoing Dr. Beckman's point about you've got to fund basic science. You don't know where that's going to lead. Okay, now, one example of that in fruit flies have this fantastic ability, the genetics you can use, to rapidly generate mutant flies and identify the genes that cause that mutation. Okay, so this has been done for quite a few, quite a long time now, and just as a couple of examples, the genes that regulate how the body is formed were first identified in fruit flies. And that ultimately resulted in the 1995 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. Understanding innate immunity, one component of that was, again, first identified in fruit flies. Now, just one example very close to home. You've all seen pictures, I think, of insect compound eyes. These beautiful structures, really elaborately, finely tuned pieces of biology. Very easy to mutate those find specific genes that causes the normal development of those. It turns out they're regulated by this fairly complicated cascade of signaling in the cells, okay? <clears throat> what it turns out is that this pathway is found in all sorts of cells, often misregulated in cancers. This particular component here are receptor tyrosine kinases. Doesn't necessarily mean very much, but these are often found and then mutated to be permanently switched on in various cancers, okay? So you could take inhibitors to slow down that. 
And that's actually what happened at OHSU. Brian Drucker ultimately des de um, designed and invented or discovered this, this uh, compound, Gleevec, that um, is now used to treat chronic myeloid leukemia. And at this point, I think um, 250,000 patients have been saved through this drug, which ultimately got its origins 30 years ago, studying how fly eyes develop. You can't go to NIH and say, I want to cure cancer by studying how fly eyes develop. It takes a long time. You don't know where it's going to come from. OK. So the other way you can do it is you can also study the function or dysfunction of a gene that is known to be implicated in a human disease. OK? So you might think that's kind of weird. Flies don't look anything like humans. OK? Humans have about 30,000 genes. Fruit flies have 15,000 genes. But what's interesting is that because many of the genes in humans come as multiple copies of, diff of closely related genes, virtually every single gene that you can find in a human has a direct orthologue in fruit flies. Okay? So going on to ALS, we heard there are 34 different genes or so that have been directly implicated in ALS. This is a list of them. Almost every single one of those genes has a direct ortholog in fruit flies. So you can go into a fruit fly and say, what does this gene do? Can we make this same mutation that you find in human patients? What does it do in fruit flies? What are the other related genes that are regulated in that? And through you know, the last 30 years, we've seen how many of those processes are directly replicated in fruit flies. We should be able to get an understanding of the basic biology by using fruit flies. What I want to talk to you today about is one of these genes, this gene here, TAR DNA binding protein, which Dr. Goslin has already introduced today, TDP43. Okay? So <clears throat> I don't need to tell you that ALS is caused by the selective death of motor neurons that then lead to paralysis. The question is, what is it that's happening in those motor neurons that's causing them to die? So again, We've, we've heard already today that the histopathology in ALS patients, you find these protein aggregates in the cytoplasm. So let me just show you that here. Here is a neuron, okay? That's its nucleus. This is the cell body, and in it is this big glob of protein, okay? You can immediately imagine that's not going to be very good for that neuron, okay? Now, the great breakthrough came in about 2006, where they identified the major component of this glob here, a glob of protein, as being TDP43. And as it turns out, TDP43 aggregates in motor neurons are very strongly associated with ALS. And in virtually the vast majority of all cases, so familial ALS as well as sporadic ALS, they're characterized by these TDP43 inclusions. Okay, it's a very nice marker. It's strongly associated with ALS. But the critically important question to answer is, do these aggregates actually cause ALS? OK, so how can we go about answering that question? So one way to do it, again, using fruit flies as an example, and it's been done actually in quite a large number of different systems now. One of the genetic tools that we have in flies is this, known as this GAL4 UAS system which is really very useful for being able to express exogenous genes into any cell or tissue type which we care for. Okay? And you start out by having one line of flies. These are transgenic flies. They have this gene in them that has what's known as a tissue-specific promoter. It's the coding that says where that gene is going to be expressed and when it's going to be expressed in the fly. That's coupled to what's a yeast transcription factor, GAL4. Okay. There are many hundreds of these lines available in stock centers. You can just go online, find the fly you're interested in, email the stock center, you'll get the fly in a couple of weeks. Cheap, simple, really easy. So I want to focus on just three of these lines that we've been using. One that specifically expresses in all neurons, another that specifically expresses in photoreceptors, and another, most important to this audience, is specifically expresses in motor neurons. So then you take another fly line that has whatever effector protein you care to name. Okay? 
and that's coupled to a coding sequence that responds to this GAL4. So both of these two flies, these parent flies, are completely normal and wild type. When you cross them together and look at their progeny, you will get, depending on which crosses you make, and depending on which the effector system is. In this case, let's put TDP43 into specific cells, okay? So if we cross this line here with this line here, you'll get human TDP43 expressed in all neurons, okay? So several years ago, postdoc Dennis Hazlett came to the lab and decided to do that experiment, and the first one he tried was APPL GAL4 expressing in all neurons, and that turned out to be lethal. So these, 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 the two parental animals were perfectly fine. Their progeny died immediately after hatching. Okay, so that doesn't give you very much to work with. So then he um, put them into fly eyes. Now what's really nice about the fly eye is that flies don't need their eyes to survive. Okay? But I already told you that ultimately Gleevec came about by studying how fly eyes develop. So when Dennis then put human TDP43 in just the photoreceptors of fly eyes, you got this ugly system happening. Basically, those fly, all the photoreceptors died very rapidly. So clearly this protein, if you put too much of it in to a cell, it's nasty, okay? He then put it into motor neurons and did this very simple assay, just measured how well those flies can climb, okay? And so you can see that wild-type flies climb pretty well when they first emerge from the pupae, and then over time, they get old and they don't climb as well, okay? When he put TDP43 into motor neurons, they had a much poorer outcome. They started out okay, but they very rapidly declined. Now, that really isn't that surprising, given what I've shown you before, how nasty TDP43 is if you have too much of it. And does this really have anything to do with ALS at all? Okay, you're just putting a poisonous protein into a cell. And remember, this protein is naturally occurring in pretty much every neuron. So there's something weird going on here. So <coughs> basically, motor neurons exhibit these cytoplasmic aggregates, but they also, when you look closely, show a loss from the nucleus. Okay, so that's shown here. So here's a cell. So in most of these cells here, you see these little tiny brown spots in the nucleus? They're the normal levels of TDP43 in the nucleus doing what it normally does. Then you have a cell here that has this big aggregate in the cytoplasm, and you notice that the nucleus no longer has TDP43 in it. So what seems to be the happening is not only do you have these nasty aggregates in the cell, but you're losing its normal function. So is that actually what's going on? So what is the function of TDP43? And again, Dr. Gosling gave a very nice introduction on basic cell, cell biology, which hopefully you can remember back from Biology 101. All cells start with genes made up of DNA and ultimately have some sort of function, okay? The first step in that process is that the DNA is unraveled and basically you make a messenger, a messenger RNA. So that's the messenger RNA that's coming out, okay? The messenger RNA then needs to get processed in quite elaborate and complicated ways, okay, cut into different pieces, modified a little bit here and there, and that, that then ultimately makes the protein, which then carries out the function. So what TDP43 seems to do is that it's involved in this modification of the RNA. And I think, again, Dr. Goslin introduced today that one of the major breakthroughs over the last few years is how messenger RNA biology is being messed up in ALS. Under lots of different types of genes, it's the RNA that's being messed up. And that's also true for a wide variety of other different neurodegenerative disorders. So if TDP43 is removed from a cell, you're gonna have problems, right? So what I think as a sort of a very simplistic model for what TDP43 does and what is happening in ALS patients is that in a normal cell, you have most of the TDP43 in the nucleus. You have a little bit out there in the cytoplasm that's moving out into the cytoplasm to basically regulate different genes. Then something happens, okay? That could be through mutations. It could be through dysfunction of superoxide dismutase, a whole variety of different things. And this protein then, 
TDP43 becomes misshapen. That then actually acts as a seed to aggregate more proteins. So it basically acts as a sponge to pull out all the good forms of TDP43 from the nucleus, and that's what forms these big globs in the cytoplasm. Okay? Now when that happens, you no longer have this gene regulation taking place. That ultimately leads to the mononoin degenerating. Okay, so if that's what happens in ALS, how can we go about solving it? So what we think is happening is that ALS is taking place when mononoins have these aggregates, but they're losing normal function from the nucleus. So how do we solve that? What, what can we, how can we approach this? So one way is we certainly need to prevent those aggregations of proteins. Okay, now, if those aggregates, so ALS, median age of onset, 50 years of age, maybe these aggregates are actually taking place really early, and it's just an accumulation of them over time. And so, if we were to solve it by actually preventing aggregation, we'd need to know very early on when that's likely to occur. That could be really quite tricky unless you have really good markers that lead to being able to predict when this is taking place. Another way, of course, and as was mentioned earlier, we could disperse those aggregates once they appear. Maybe that will then restore the function of TDP43. Now, problem I have with this, this is very similar to Alzheimer's disease, okay? People have known for a long time Alzheimer's is associated with these big tangles and plaques in the brain, and a huge amount of research and drug money has gone into trying to dissolve those with minimal success, with no success at all in patients. So even though I think this research should carry on to trying to find out how you can disperse those aggregates, I don't think that's the only answer. Another way to go is to say, what if you could identify the genes that are regulated by TDP43 and restore their function in some way? Could, would that be a way to go? And that's basically the way we're approaching it in my lab. So. First of all, I want to give you an example, uh, show you what our fly model for ALS is. And basically, it's making a mutant fly that lacks TDP43. And this was again done by Dennis in the lab. And we found that when we knocked out that gene, it's an essential gene, those flies die. But they die as adults, so just before they emerge as an adult fly. The larvae are still viable. And this is a video of a normal fruit fly larvae, a maggot. And you can see it has these very nice pronounced peristaltic waves as it crawls along the substrate. Okay? Let's have a look what a maggot looks like if you remove TDP43. So, they're not paralyzed. They're basically a normal size. But you can see they crawl very, very much more poorly. Okay? Occasionally, you'll see a peristaltic wave, but it moves slower, they're far less frequently, and they move um, very much less distances. So the question is, how does TDP43 control locomotion? In fact, what are the genes that are regulated by TDP43? So what we're trying to do is find out which of the genes that are regulated by TDP43 regulate the normal locomotion. So 15,000 genes in Drosophila. So what Dennis then did was he dissected out the nervous system of fruit fly maggots and used new sequencing technology to measure the expression of every single gene in the nervous system. He found that there were about 8,000 genes expressed in a larval nervous system, so about half the total number of genes, and about 1,000 of those genes were altered in these TDP43 mutant larvae. So 1,000 genes, that's still a large number to deal with. He then used a number of different tri tricks and tools to see if he could identify which genes were directly affected by TDP43 and identified 200 genes as good targets. Now, if you're working in mice, 200 genes to go through every single gene in a mouse would be exceedingly difficult, time-consuming, time and expensive. We can do it pretty straightforwardly in fruit flies. Let me show you how we did that. So, what we're trying to find out, remember, is which of the differentially expressed genes contribute to the normal loco to the locomotion defects in the animals that are loss of TDP43. So we can use genetics very quickly to restore the expression of those candidate genes in the mutant background, and then measure the crawling behavior. So 200 genes, that's still quite a few to get, ho hold, get through, and we actually had a great deal of help here from a high school student, Jessica Maurice, came into the lab, she's an engineer, 
and helped us develop this automated, semi-automated um, tracking system. So we use a video capture, a video to capture the larvae um, as they're crawling. We then can track using software individual animals um, as they crawl around. And then you can visualize that data and um, generate the numbers. And so she did this through several months, not, didn't really take very long, went through 200 or so genes and identified 15 different genes which when we restored their expression patterns in fruit flies, in the mutant fruit, fruit flies, we had partial or completely rescue of the defects. Okay? So I want to tell you about just one of those genes, and that's a gene known as cacophony. So what's really cool about working in fruit flies is we can come up with all these cool names for, for genes. Now, interestingly, one of the genes that Dr. Goslin talked to you about, no-go, did you think, oh, that's a cool, sort of interesting name? It was named in a fruit fly first and first identified in the fruit fly. <laughs> so, cacophony is a voltage gated calcium channel, okay? And the proteins, levels of proteins are reduced in TDP43 mutants. So, what does that do in the nervous system, okay? So, I think all you know, all neurons communicate to each other through the release of neurotransmitter, okay? And so an electrical signal comes down the axon, and as it invades the terminal at the end of one neuron, it activates these voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium floods into the tip of the neuron, and that causes the transmitter to be released. So you can see it's a critically important gene in the nervous system. Okay? So this is the system that we're looking at. This is a Drosophila larvae. This is the brain. That's its spinal cord. These are the nerves running out to all of these different muscles, okay? So then I was very lucky to have a very talented postdoc come to the lab, Jie Cheng, who's in the audience here. And he was very interested in trying to find out what cacophony does. So he found that if you look right out here at the neuromuscular junction, that's shown here, okay? And these little dots here are the little clusters of calcium channels at the muscle, in the neuromuscular, at the neuromuscular junction, in the nerve terminals. And the lights aren't great here, but I think you can notice that there's far fewer speckles in the mutant. So there's less cacophony out at the neuromuscular junction. So that makes sense. They don't crawl as well. The neuromuscular junctions don't work as well. That's what you'd expect. Can we prove that? Let's put cacophony back in to the motor neurons in these TDP43 uh, knockout larvae. And when we do that, he rescued the crawling behavior and very specifically. So this is just measuring how far the larvae crawl, a couple of controls here. This is the TDP43 uh, knockout larvae. In, in fruit flies, the gene is called TBPH, but it's, it's essentially the same gene. And so then when he puts it back into all neurons, remember the APPL-GAL4 system, expressing cacophony in the mutant background, we completely rescue the crawling defect, okay? If you put it into another class of neurons that are actually the interneurons, it has no effect. But what was remarkable, if you just put it into motor neurons, you also got almost complete rescue of the crawling defects. Okay? Now, this isn't the whole story because this doesn't rescue lethality. So remember, there are hundreds of genes that are regulated. We're just looking at one tiny component. I mean, the ultimate goal is to identify all of these and maybe put them together to see if we can come up with a cocktail of genes that will rescue the entire phenotype that we're seeing at all. Okay, so <clears throat> we then wanted to really understand, okay, how does cacophony actually work in the nervous system and what was really going wrong in these animals? And that was when we were lucky to have a graduate student join the lab, Kayla Lemke, who's also in the audience. And she was really interested in trying to find out what's actually going wrong here at the neuromuscular junction. What was really surprising was that the neuromuscular junction seemed to be pretty normal. Okay, now that's really surprising. You've got less cacophony out there. We know cacophony is needed for neurotransmitter release, but we're actually getting normal physiology. So there's probably some sort of compensation that's taking place there. And if we can tease that apart and find out what that compensation is, we might gain even more insights into what, what's actually going on with these animals. So if it's not actually happening, the problem isn't actually happening at the neuromuscular junction here, where is it happening? Is it actually happening in the CNS? 
So what she's done, been doing very, very recently is she's been taking two electrodes and attaching them to the nerves here and here and recording the normal electrical activity as it comes out of the central nervous system. But what you see is this sort of pattern here. So you can see these bursts of activity. So remember the behavior I showed you, these waves of peristaltic contractions moving up the animal. Okay? And you see these bursts of activity, this nice patterned output. And if you look from one segment to the next, you can see there's a slight delay. Okay, so that seems to recapitulate that behavior of these electrical waves of contraction moving up the animal. Now, when she looked at mutant animals, she saw no pattern at all. So that strongly suggests that there's something wrong with the CNS that you're not getting that pattern output anymore. And so what the next experiment to do now is to put cacophony back into motor neurons and see if that rescues this electrical pattern. And then we'll start to get some glimmerings of an idea of what is going wrong with those motor neurons when you lose TDP43. Now, the reason, another reason why this was particularly exciting was that mouse models that look at TDP43 loss of function. They also look to see how many different genes were downregulated and upregulated and altered. And they found a whole bunch of genes, hundreds of different genes that were changed. Very prominent in that is the misregulation of calcium homeostasis. And in particular, right here, the voltage-gated calcium channel. So in a mouse model, you're also seeing a loss of calcium channels, cacophony-like uh, proteins. Now, one reason that this is really exciting is that there are already a whole host of different drugs that are available for activating calcium channels. So then the question is, okay, we can genetically rescue these fruit flies. Can we pharmacologically rescue those fruit flies? So that's another thing that Kaylee has been working on. We can feed the larvae calcium channel activators, so that should be mimicking putting cacophony back in, okay? And just very recently, she's come up with this data, with this particular calcium agonist, nephrocetum, and you can see that you feed these TB, TDP43 knockout larvae, this calcium agonist, you'll partially rescue falling behavior. Now, this is a long, long, long way from doing anything with humans, but what I hope that we're gonna end up doing is by, if we can identify all the different genes that are regulated by TDP43 that are involved with the phenotypes associated with the loss, maybe we can come up with a cocktail of different drugs that affect each of those genes individually, and that that will be an effective therapy. So just a little bit more about nephrocetum. As I say, it's a calcium channel activator. It also activates a number of different specific systems. It's already been shown to act as an anticonvulsant and have various different neuroprotective effects. And very bizarrely, I actually sort of Googled it just a couple of days ago, and people are selling it as a cognitive enhancer. So supposedly it should be able to do some good. And so the nice thing about these things is that they're already FDA approved. So it would be much less of the mountain of paperwork that Joe was describing, to potentially start to get these into any sort of um, trials at all. But again, we're a long, long, long way from that at all. Okay, so the $64 million question is, is caco are, are altered cacophony levels, do they actually play a role in ALS? Okay, hopefully I've convinced you that in flies, they do. Seems like in mice, they also, seems to be pretty good evidence that they do that, but of course, what about human ALS patients? Now, it's very easy, as I say, to go from human genes to fly genes. It's a little bit more complicated to go the other way because there are more genes in humans. So flies, for instance, have three genes that code for voltage-gated calcium channels, whereas humans have 10, okay? So the most r closely related to cacophony are the CAV2 class, okay? And so we've been very lucky to have the Oregon Brain Bank supply us with spinal cord samples from both ALS patients and frontotemporal dementia patients with ALS, already been diagnosed as having TDP43 proteinopathies, okay? And Ju Cheng has ta taken some of those samples and measured the levels of those specific channels in these patient samples, and very preliminary data so far is that we do seem to see 
in some of these samples for the CA for just one class, right, for just one gene of this one class, the CAV 2.2 channels, there do seem there does seem to be a reduction in the levels of the protein in these samples. Very, very, very early days, and then at the moment I'm writing a whole bunch of grants to see if we can get more money to actually spend this. So talk to your Congress people. <clears throat> okay, so that's pretty much all I had to say. Um, a lot of acknowledgments. All the people that have been doing um, the work, most particularly Dennis Hazlett that really initiated this whole project, and then Jia Cheng and Kaylee, who I said are in the audience that are really sort of continuing it. And of course, the Oregon Brain Bank is now providing us with some samples. And we've been very also lucky to have funding from NDS and also the National uh, uh, Association of the ALS Association that's been funding this research. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Morton. And so I know I promised a 15-minute break right now, but we think we should maybe use the momentum in the room in terms of what you've just heard and being able to relate it to the previous speakers. Um, so I think I'd like to invite the panel up now. And in a moment, uh, the team will come and take away the podium so that your view is not obstructed from that side of the room. And we'll go into questions and answers now. That way, when we're done, refreshments will be out there again, and we can have some social time. But is everyone OK with that? Would you go straight into a little more question and answer? Okay, so if I can invite Dr. Goslin and uh, Dr. Beckman back up. <laughs>